All right, our next speaker is Stacy Wiggins. Dr. Wiggins is a science advisor for the Division of Seafood Safety in the Office of Food Safety at the US Food and Drug Administration's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Um, over to you, Dr. Wiggins. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Get my PowerPoint started. There we go. Thank you and hello everyone. It is an honor to present at today's National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Food Forum webinar on microplastics. And I will be presenting highlights from a scientific review of microplastics in food and water. This scientific review was conducted by the Food and Drug Administration or FDA's Micro and Nanoplastics in Foods group. This group is comprised of both research and policy experts from the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition with representatives from the Office of Food Safety, the Office of Regulatory Science, the Office of Food Additive Safety, Office of Cosmetics and Colors, Office of Applied Research and Safety Assessment, and the office of the center director. We also have expert representation from FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine, the National Center for Toxicological Research, and the Office of Regulatory Affairs. Thank you, Kara, for the nice introduction to microplastics. So I'll be able to just jump right into microplastics in foods. And I wanted to start with looking at the findings from our scientific review with respect to the potential pathways of microplastics exposure to humans. These include inhalation, dermal, and ingestion. Ingestion of microplastics may occur via consumption of food and beverages. Also, dust fallout of microplastics in the atmosphere during meal preparation at homes as well as the oral exposure to plastic products such as toothbrushes. The remaining of this presentation, I'll focus on ingestion and in particular on the ingestion of food and beverages. And I'll mention just briefly the issue of dust fallout and the potential for the association of microplastics from dust fallout to be a form of exposure. Microplastics have been reported in the scientific literature for a range of food and beverages. And these include fish, mollusks, crustaceans, bottled water, drinking water, salt, honey, sugar, beer, poultry, nori, milk, tea, soft drinks, and energy drinks. However, the methodologies employed in each study must be considered. In our scientific review, we found a lack of standardized definitions, a lack of standardized methods. We found a lack of appropriate analytical standards and a lack of standardized reporting metrics. For example, some studies were reported in particle concentrations and others in mass. Furthermore, Many of the studies reporting microplastics did not use an analytical method that allows for confirmation that the particles detected were in fact plastics. Methods such as Raman spectroscopy, Fourier transform infrared or FTIR spectroscopy, or pyrolysis gas chromatography with mass spectrometry, GCMS, would be necessary for confirmation. Many studies have also lacked appropriate quality controls and quality assurance mechanisms to prevent sample contamination. These methodology challenges, among others, have resulted in a lack of reliable quantitative data on microplastics in food and beverages. These challenges have also made it very difficult to compare across or synthesize among studies. 
These methodology considerations were also noted in the proceedings of a workshop in 2020 by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The report stated that one challenge in this area is that there are different sampling, sample preparation, detection, and characterization methods in use, some of which may not be appropriate or reliable for detecting microplastics. Taking into consideration these methodology challenges, as well as the number and quality of reports of microplastics in foods and beverages in the literature, and the products that fall under the purview of FDA, I decided to narrow the rest of the presentation on seafood and bottled water. Reports of microplastics in seafood are predominant compared to other food commodities. Microplastics have been reported in a wide range of fish, mollusks, including mussels, clams, oysters, scallops, and snails, and crustaceans, including shrimp and lobster. Some of the studies focused on environmental samples whereas others focused on seafood samples that were of commercial relevance for human consumption. As a part of our scientific review, we qualitatively synthesized information on the occurrence of microplastics in seafood, yet as mentioned, reliable quantitative data are lacking. So I'd like to present some of the findings that were qualitative in nature where we were able to draw some conclusions from the studies. In this particular slide presents some of the example polymer types that are found in seafood. And this includes polyamide, polyethylene, polyethylene comethylacrylate, polyethylene terephthalate, polyethylene vinyl acetate, and polyurethane. It is notable that these polymer types found in seafood appear to be more diverse than the polymer types found in other commodities. I'd also like to mention here that in terms of the shapes of microplastics found in seafood, microfibers have been reported to be the dominant shape in seafood, and that is followed by fragments. To look at the potential sources of microplastics in seafood, a study by Coverington and others in 2019 evaluated microplastics in Manila clams and Pacific oysters from an aquaculture site compared to those wild caught near the aquaculture site. And the study was to determine the influence of aquaculture itself on microplastics in shellfish. For example, were there higher concentrations of polymers and shellfish associated with aquaculture, such as polystyrene, polypropylene, and PVC? And this was in comparison to what might be found in the shellfish that were wild caught, not in the aquaculture site. The authors, however, did not find this to be the case. Instead, there was a dominance of microfibers notably nylon and polyester, regardless of whether the shellfish was harvested from the aquaculture site or from the wild. In terms of differences in microplastics and bivalves compared to fish, it was hypothesized that bivalves or filter feeders may pose a greater risk since they can filter and thereby concentrate particles from the water. It was also originally hypothesized that fish would pose less of a risk as it was thought that microplastics would be located primarily in the gastrointestinal tract and that they would be removed during evisceration. However, it's not quite that simple. And you can see on the figure on the left by Ward and others in 2019, where they actually found that shellfish mollusks in particular are not passive filter feeders, but instead they found that both oysters and mussels had the capability of ingesting or rejecting polystyrene spheres and to a lesser extent, 
rejecting the microfibers. And this indicates that the concentrations that we might find of microplastics in bivalves is less than would have otherwise been hypothesized. Also, if you look at the figure on the right, Bazzutini and others, you'll find that there is evidence of microplastics also in the fish tissue. And while the studies definitely demonstrate that there are higher concentrations in the gastrointestinal tract, this particular study highlights that there is the possibility of microplastics in the flesh as well. It has been hypothesized that microplastics may bioaccumulate up the food web like some other contaminants. While trophic transfer has been reported in studies, evidence of bioaccumulation in marine food webs has not been found. For example, this study on the right by Walkinshaw and others demonstrated that microplastic particles per gram of wet weight decreased for organisms as you move into the higher trophic levels. So as you move from the bivalves up to, um, for example, yellowfin tuna on the far right-hand side. And instead of this being bioaccumulation, this actually demonstrates a dilution. And the authors concluded that seafood and lower trophic levels may pose a greater risk compared to organisms in the higher trophic level. Moving to bottled water, there was a survey by Mason and others, and this particular survey included looking at 259 bottles of water from 19 locations in nine countries, and they found the majority to contain microplastics. They also found a higher concentrations of smaller microplastics compared to the larger sizes. So just relatively speaking, larger amounts were present for size ranges of less than 100 microns. And I will point out that there was limited spectroscopy analysis in this study, but it does start to demonstrate some of these trends. It's also noticeable, notable that they found fragments and microfibers to be the most common shapes, and also polypropylene was the most abundant polymer. And this is typically what bottle caps are comprised of. And as such, the authors concluded that microplastics in bottled water may at least in part be associated with packaging and or bottling. And I'll just make mention of other beverages that we found in the scientific review, specifically for tea and milk. We also found that the authors concluded that given the polymer types that were found, there was the implication that the microplastics in those products may at least in part be associated with packaging or processing. The World Health Organization in 2019 and references within that report indicated that single use plastic bottles were lower in microplastics compared to reusable plastic bottles, but it's also notable that they identified microplastics present in glass bottles. I mentioned the exposure pathway of dust fallout. Caterino and others compared microplastics in wild caught mussels to microplastics in dust fallout that settled onto a meal in the home during preparation. And so they took the number of particles that they identified during meal preparation, just using filters in the room to capture this fallout. And they also measured the microplastics that were in mussels. And they looked at the concentrations for mussels that were harvest, harvested over different seasons. And when they took these values and extrapolated them out to consumption, they found that the amounts of microplastics would be expected to be higher in the dust fallout compared to the mussels. So for example, they estimated 123 microplastic particles per year per capita or per person might be found in the mussels, whereas at the very conservative end of the fallout measurements, they estimated 13,731 microplastic particles per year 
per person or per capita. And this just really indicated and emphasized the need to put the exposure from mussels or other food products into a broader exposure context. I'd like to just briefly touch upon the potential impact on human health of ingested microplastics. It's important to note that health risk is a function of both the hazard and exposure. And while microplastic occurrence has been reported in food and water, a full quantitative exposure, as well as determination of the hazard, is needed to determine if there is a health risk. So as we've indicated, there is occurrence of microplastics in food and water. Quantitatively, we're still lacking a great deal of information. And we are also lacking quantitative exposure estimates that would also include consumption patterns. Having said that, the consumption of microplastics in foods has been documented, but for there to be an impact to lead to systemic conditions in humans, microplastics would have to be absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract and distributed to organs and tissues. It has been summarized in the European Food Safety Authority's 2016 report and references within that particles greater than 150 microns are not absorbed by the human body. Particles less than 150 microns that may be absorbed have an extremely limited likelihood of equal to or less than 0.3% of crossing the gut into the circulatory system. In a study by Schwabel and others, they examined stool samples from eight individuals selected from around the world and found all eight samples to contain microplastics. While this is an extremely small sample size and may not be representative of the full population, the findings indeed support the theory that microplastics are ingested and they are excreted. The median of microplastics detected in this particular study was 20 microplastics per 10 grams of stool, and they found polypropylene and polyethylene terephthalate to be the most abundant types of polymers detected. It's notable that there was another study by Smith and others that reported that more than 90% of the microplastics ingested is excreted. And finally, toxicity studies on microplastics are limited and results have been contradictory. For example, you can see a study on the left by Dane and others where they reported effects such as effects on energy and lipid metabolism, oxidative stress, and neurotoxic effects. Whereas the study on the right by Stock and others, they did not observe any effects, an absence of histological lesions and an absence of inflammatory response. And the authors of that study concluded that oral exposure of microplastics to humans does not pose a public health risk. And we will be hearing a little bit more about the potential impact on human health in the next presentation. So with that, the conclusions from our scientific review are that microplastics have been reported in a range of foods. However, if you take a look at the foods that have been reported so far, this is a very limited representation of foods that might be consumed by the general population. I'll also note that there are limitations in drawing quantitative conclusions due to the methodology challenges that I mentioned. We found that polymers in seafood exhibited the greatest variability and diversity compared to the types of polymers that were found in other food commodities. And in terms of bottled water, the authors of those studies in the scientific literature documented that polymer types that were observed indicated at least in part the polymers were associated with packaging or processing. I would like to note, however, that there is no evidence that food packaging materials, if used as intended, are any cause of concern. 
We also found that microplastics from dust fallout during meal preparation was reported and seemed to be significant compared to the microplastics that were reported in the food commodity that was compared in that particular study. So it is important to take these comparisons and different exposure pathways into consideration. We also found that there was a lack of evidence clearly supporting that microplastics impact human health at this time. During our scientific review, we identified a number of outstanding knowledge gaps. In general, the knowledge gaps, some of which Dr. Law already mentioned, include the lack of standard definitions for both microplastics and nanoplastics. There's a lack of standardized and fit for purpose metrics for reporting data. With respect to methods, there is a lack of appropriate standards and reference materials, a lack of standardized sample collection and preparation techniques, and a lack of standardized detection methods. And this is particularly the case for methods that could be used for a variety of food matrices. And I think there's a real opportunity here to align our analytical approaches with the intended applications. It's noticeable that we still have needs for method development and exploration all the way to validation and having these fit for purpose methods. There's a need for both qualitative and quantitative measurements. And there's also a need for looking at real world environmentally relevant mixtures. So one thing I mean by this is that some of the studies used unrealistically high concentrations of microplastics in their study, as opposed to the concentrations of microplastics that are being reported in particular matrices or environments. I'll also note that real world samples and mixtures are lacking in studies and oftentimes studies have focused on the use of pristine polystyrene spheres, for example. We also have needs for methods in nanoplastics, the smaller sizes. We're lacking information on the occurrence in foods, particularly quantitative data, as well as a broader coverage of different food types and specifically food types that are in terrestrial environments as opposed to aquatic environments, which as Dr. Law mentioned is where much of the research has received attention to date. We have a number of knowledge gaps in toxicology and pharmacology, including the lack of understanding on fate and transport, lack of understanding of dosimetry, and of course, the lack of understanding of microplastics and nanoplastics and their toxicity to humans, especially considering the complexity of these different plastic types. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to answering questions and the panel discussion at the end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Wiggins. Um, we do have a number of questions in the Q&A, <laughs> um, I think more than five minutes worth. So um, the first question I have for you is, are we now finding microplastic and nanoplastic in land animals? You reported on chicken, but the others seem to have water and ocean ties. So is this primarily a water issue? I wouldn't say that it's necessarily primarily a water issue. I think it's more a function of that's where the majority of the studies have focused so far. And it's more emerging into terrestrial environments now. So I'm expecting that we'll see more studies looking at land animals and other terrestrial environments moving forward. Thank you. All right, the other one I have for you is, can you please elaborate on trophic transfer? Is there a theory of half-life uh, for this type of contamination? Thank you, that's a great question. So for trophic transfer, this really indicates that microplastics in one organism can be ingested with you know, that organism being consumed by something higher up the food chain. And we are seeing that there are reports that microplastics are moving through the food web in that manner. However, what we're not seeing is that with every trophic step higher and higher, the concentrations are increasing over time 
And the studies to date indicate that this is because ingestion or excretion is happening at a higher rate than accumulation can happen um, as it moves up the food web. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for probably one more question. Um, the ones coming in now are fairly technical. All right, so because of the quantity, because quantitative insights are currently limited due to the lack of standardized and comparable analytical methods, are the currently proposed analytical methods, IR, Raman methods, et cetera, sufficiently robust? What challenges might these methods encounter in the future? Thank you, that's a great question. I think there is the recognition among the scientific community that there is the need for these robust methods to be able to distinguish the microplastics. And I have definitely noticed a, a shift in the publications that are recently coming out where they are incorporating these methods. They're also incorporating more of the quality controls that were lacking earlier on in the infancy of this particular topic. And so I think we're seeing improvements there. I would say the challenge of the methods that I mentioned like Ramon spectroscopy and FTIR is a size-based limitation. So Dr. Law mentioned nanoplastics at the end of her talk, and that's certainly an issue with the smaller sized plastics that are even smaller than microplastics. And those methods are very challenged at being able to detect those smaller sizes. And so I think that's where we have an opportunity to um, look at analytical methods that will advance our ability to look at even smaller particles. Thank you very much. I expect you'll be getting a number of more questions in the panel session.